Okay, this slide says it all. I had to cough and I tried to pause quick time, but it didn't work. It just absolutely ended it. I couldn't see any way to continue, so I'm sorry. Um, I hope you remember where we left off at the <laughs> end of chapter 18, part 2. So this is uh, where we were approximately. And I was uh, beginning to explain this, that in the upper left, of course, we have Manet's Olympia. And in the lower right, we have a, what would be sort of a typical French Academy acceptable representation of nude females. So you can see the difference in painting styles, that the ones in the lower right are made to look very sort of appealing, beautifully sensual, and not Manet's at all. <clears throat> I'm not going to ever pause it again, even if I have to cough, cough which I just might. <clears throat> so let's see what the Americans are doing. So realism was unbroken in American painting as far back as the colonial portrait painters. Winslow Homer was a reporter and an illustrator for Harper's Weekly, producing works of the Civil War and popularizing watercolor. Later, he created the lifeline seen here in 1884, depicting a Coast Guard saving a shipwrecked woman with a breeches boy. Homer preferred realism, and he was inspired by French naturalist art. He painted nostalgic themes, innocence outdoors. His work was mass-produced and extremely popular. <clears throat> this is... This is um, what I think he's best known for is his watercolors. He lived down in the Caribbean at one point, and so he did a lot of subjects of people in the Caribbean, and this is just beautiful watercolor work here. You can just look at the, the water and the sky. The watercolors are just pigments mixed with water, and they're very, very fresh. They're never reworked. <clears throat> now, um, another American realist here is Thomas Aiken. Is from Philadelphia. Um, he specialized in Frank portraits. He studied painting and medical anatomy, and in France he studied with Jérôme, um, the realist who was a student of David's. David, sorry. Uh, the Gross Clinic here was controversial because surgery was deemed an unfit subject for art. It portrays Dr. Samuel David Gross as a heroic figure spotlighted with light on his forehead and bloodied right hand. Dr. Gross performs leg surgery on a living patient here. His colleagues are identifiable portraits. The patient's mother hides her face. So this is the mother over here. Uh, anesthetics have been used since 1846. I really like this painting, so I'm going to point out some things. I'm going to get rid of the caption so you can look at it closely. Um, so this man back here is holding a cloth over the face of the patient, and that cloth would have chloroform or ether on it, something that would uh, render the patient unconscious for the duration of the surgery. But somebody had to keep holding it, and they would continually drop more liquid on the cloth. <clears throat> Um, what I like to do when I'm teaching in class in person is ask my students to look at this painting and imagine yourself in that situation, if you would be comfortable, and what is missing here. So you've probably all seen hospital dramas on TV if you've never actually been in a hospital. And so look at this and think of this as a surgeon, surgeon in a surgery in an operating room. So what's missing? And students always come up with it. Well, he's not got a mask on, which is something everybody's wearing these days. So none of these men are wearing masks. None of them are wearing scrubs. They're just wearing their street clothes. It's like they just walked in from the, the street. They're not even wearing gloves. See that? Bare hands. So to us, who are very germ conscious, especially these days, this is horrifying. We just think, don't they understand? 
And the answer is no, they didn't understand germs. Germ theory was just sort of in its infancy and beginning to be known. But um, practices change, surgical practices change. But let's look at the painting. It is realism. It is American realism showing a subject that is um, not normal subject for a painting. So it's not something uh, edifying. It's not an illustration of a biblical scene. It is more or less an everyday scene, only in this case it's in a medical school. <clears throat> so here's another Aikens, a similar subject. Uh, so he's, you know, like I said, he studied anatomy. So if he's very comfortable around um, medical, the medical uh, community. But now this surgery shows that the the doctors at least have on scrubs, so they've um, they've cleaned up a little bit. They're not wearing their street clothes, although all of the med students are wearing street clothes. But they still don't have masks on, and they still do not have gloves. So notice over here the bare hands. <coughs> and this man is the anesthesiologist. I wonder if that's a woman. No, it's got to be a man. Um, and there's a cone over the patient's face with uh, the anesthetic in it. So now, of course, this is the era of photography, so I had to show you a photograph, an actual photograph of a surgery in an operating theater here. Um, and here are the doctors in their street clothes, no masks, no gloves, patients out on the table. <clears throat> It looks like this cabinet behind them has a whole array of surgical tools, like scalpels, etc. And over here, this basin looks like it has something that might have been removed from the patient. So I'm kind of thinking this is after the, the surgery has been performed and the photograph is being taken. <coughs> so there. Photography. Oh, there's so many of my favorite artists. I mean, every every time period we go to, I have somebody I really like. So here's Henry Osawatama, another favorite. And this one is kind of out of order. I warned you at one point that we were going to be moving back and forth in the 19th century, and we're, we've come really far in this one. This is 1893. I'm not entirely sure why he's thrown in here, except that he's kind of associated with those other um, Americans. And he was a student of Thomas Aiken, so that's probably another reason. So Henry Oswald Tanner studied with Aikens before moving to Paris. After the move, his paintings received favorable critical attention. The banjo lesson shown here is a humanizing image of African-American life, where an elderly man teaches a young boy with serious concentration. The banjo had previously symbolized minstrels, a derogatory caricatures that Tanner sought to replace. Later, he did many biblical subjects. <clears throat> so uh, Henry also with Tanner was an African American, and he sh opens a window into African American community life, which um, no artist had done, or no artist that we're aware of had done in the past. Um, but I'm pointing out the time because I see evidence of influence from the French Impressionists here in his paint, in his handling, his loose brushwork. Just look at the, the objects on the table and the wall in the background. It's just very, very Impressionistic. Um, so Henry Tanner, there is a portrait, a photographic portrait of Henry Tanner, Henry Oswald Tanner there. And in the upper left is one of his religious subjects. So um, I, it's one of my favorites. It's called the Annunciation. And I like it because I've shown you a lot of Annunciations in this class, and they were kind of very similar. They showed Mary often reading a book, sometimes completely unaware that an angel was in her room with her, uh, and the angel almost always looked the same, really beautiful, androgynous, gorgeous wings, lovely hair, you know, flowing gown. But Henry didn't really care about what had been done in the past. He sort of thought about the concept of a supernatural being appearing in a young girl's room to tell her she was going to have a baby. 
And this is how he imagined the supernatural being, just kind of like a ray of light there. I think Mary looks puzzled. I think uh, I would have painted her with a little more fear on her face. And she's, she doesn't seem overly concerned there, but maybe she's already heard the, the message that Gabriel had for her. Another African-American artist here is Edmonia Lewis, who's another woman who picks up the chisel and the hammer and starts carving away at marbles. So she created highly successful busts and medallions of abolitionist leaders and Civil War heroes. She was inspired by the struggle of the recently freed slaves for equality. She created Forever Free here to commemorate the Emancipation Proclamation. It also symbolizes the struggles of women and Africans in general. Lewis overcame many obstacles with a, a lot of assistance and ended up in Rome with Harriet Hosmer, the other woman sculptor I showed you earlier. So um, they're both very determined women who are out there slinging hammers and chisels against the marble blocks. Pretty cool. This is where I intended to stop. And since I know the next section is really long, I am going to stop here and then um, we'll pick up as we should have done with part three next.